it sometimes annoys me mm -hmm. that my obituary is going to say discovered David Hockney, mm -hmm. like the guy who sort of discovered the Beatles or something like that, whereas in fact the whole gallery was about something else. Some people reach a point of fame where they're recognised by just one name. John Casmin, or rather Kaz, art dealer and collector extraordinaire, is such a man. Now entering his 10th decade, he's been credited with turning the formerly stuffy London art scene on its head. Over tea and crumpets in his little Venice treasure trove, we roam back over the creative landscape of his youth. From homelessness and near starvation in Paris, waitering in New Zealand, to swinging London in the 60s, when, in his words, he saved David Hockney from poverty. It's a total delight to welcome the irrepressible Kaz today as my guest on the third act. Let's start at the beginning. So we're back to your, I suppose, there weren't difficult beginnings, but they weren't... Oh, yeah, no, they were difficult. Yeah, I mean, it, it, remember, we had Hitler as well. Yes, you were brought, you're brought a child of the war. Yeah, well, yeah. I was brought up, well, I was born on, you know, six years before the war mm -hmm. really affected England. Mm -hmm. Your parents were Jewish? Well, was, yes, and uh, we lived in Oxford. My grandfather had moved a great, as many of his family were willing to be moved about to out of London because he hadn't enjoyed the First World War. Was he born in England? No, no. Uh, three of my grandparents were born in Poland and came over in the late adolescence or, you know, around about, either just before or around the age of 20. But my parents and most of the people I knew were born in England and mm. certainly didn't speak Polish. They were in the, the Schmutter business? Grandpa was in the Schmutter business. My father had a different job. And then he went to work for his father, but he wasn't a well man. He was unhappy and I didn't have a good relationship with my father. And when I went to New Zealand when I was 17. I came out of a school where I was learning Latin, Greek, writing poetry mm. in Greek, mm. French, English and so forth at Morden College School and went to work in a factory but kept up my Greek and Latin by getting private lessons from people that, that were helpful in the university. I was serious about studying in ancient history and I was interested, I liked Greek and so forth. But there I was, out of school at, at 16 and put to work by my slightly neurotic and difficult father in a, a big factory, the Press Steel factory, in the accounts department, and he was trying to make me into a cost accountant. So, and I was going to night classes for accountancy and decided I just didn't want to be in England anymore. It was 1951, and rationing, grim, colourless, mm -hmm. and I was due to go at 18 into the Army and National mm -hmm. Service. How did you avoid and that? I didn't get on with it. Well, I, I managed to use my permitsa money to buy a ticket to New Zealand. I got a job in New Zealand before I went as a, a clerk in the public trustee's legal office for a couple of quid a week and paid my fare out there with a bit of help from aunties. My, my father was one of ten. He had seven sisters and mm. they were sympathetic to my predicament and coughed up a bit of money each of them. And... And I you, went to New Zealand on a ship. And you pretended you had epilepsy so that you didn't have to... Oh, how did you know that? I read it somewhere. No, that was only to get out of New Zealand training. Did you read it somewhere? Yeah. Mm. It's because I picked it out of the Thomas Mann novel, The Confessions of Felix Krull, where, in fact, it's exactly what Felix Krull does, is, is put on a fit in the street. I did it outside the main post office in Auckland in Queen Street. When I read about your life, it seems to me like it's a story out of a novel. So much of it is absurd. And you were so roguish and naughty when you were young. I mean, you did yes, that. Yes, had a naughty period. You had a very naughty period. Then you, then you changed your name, which we might oh, not say. That, but, part, but originally, not just saying it, it was really because I was writing poetry and it was a nom de plume. But I reacted. I was liberated when I was in New Zealand. I was 17. I was very shy, slightly scared, and working in a clerical job and living in a hostel, having to share a room in a waterfront hostel with a Maori boy who was also a civil servant. But I was by then a very disobedient... Uh, Citizen. Uh, what the hell what was I, actually? I was <laughs> I a know. fluctuating 
between settle down and roving, mm. like lots of people in New Zealand, or like lots of people in the world now, mm. they give up this thing and go on and run away and do that thing. I was a giver up and a taker up of all sorts of jobs, one after another. A group of people that would loosely be called bohemians, although some of them were really artists or potters mm. or painters or poets or whatever. I did write poetry. I'd come out of my mysticism phase. It's all long, too long mm. ago, and it's all in, mm. in great detail in the memories, the memorial that I did for the, for the British stories. Library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which goes on. It's the longest one they've ever had. I had 300 yeah. hours or something. Yeah, something. How incredible. incredible. Oh, I know, it's really How cool. amazing. But that's because they ask question after question. And what I, a legacy. I've got a reasonable though. memory, only because I gave up drink at a certain stage. I'm going anyway, to that. <laughs> the, I, it, it, the fact was, there would be times when I'd be settled down and have a room and, and be reading and writing poetry and be a, working at whatever mm. it was doing. I mean, for six weeks I worked in the running the poetry section of the main bookshop in Wellington. Mm. But then, every now and then I'd run away. I was, you couldn't call it footloose, I guess I was... Well, you were young, you wanted to yeah, try lots of different things. You were curious, you yeah. were young, and you wanted to try yeah, things. I kept hitting the road, uh, yeah. and... Um, were you trying to find... Occasionally being... Anti-social makes it sound as I was right. I wasn't robbing anybody. But you I did, did actually pinch books from every now and Yeah, and, and you pulled water all over the Prime Minister's head. In a, in no, no, no. That was actually part of a job and it was a tease. I, it, Sid Holland was a, a vulgar man who was a Prime Minister and I was working... I frequently worked as a wine waiter or a steward in cocktail bars mm. later on, not mm. in the early days, because I found that you could do that for a while and make a decent amount of money. And what, there was a stage when I was a wine waiter in, in a hotel and the Prime Minister the Prime Minister Holland who was a, a matey sort of fellow he wouldn't have a lot of sight to him but anyway he had the usual appalling accent and he'd ordered I can't remember why I took a shine against him but he was probably patronising him too anyway I shook up his champagne so that uh, when he wanted champagne and when I opened it it sprayed over him he took it in quite good spirit so he didn't see that I'd done it to look and then, so we hop probably a few years on to... I came um, back one day with the encouragement of the local police. People jumped ship and I took some steward's place on the ship. Oh, and back to I, was, no, I didn't even have time to say goodbye to my friend. I went down to the ship and there I was... Back to Europe. ...serving, being a, a waiter, a steward on a ship. How old were you then? Six about weeks. 20? Yeah, 20, 21. And I came back to England. Then there was that interesting period of your life where you, uh, what was he called, Victor Musgrave? Musgrave, yes, yes. I, I went to his gallery and asked if I could have a job. And, and you got a job on the basis no, no, of sleeping with his wife? Job, but I was invited up to look at his wife's... Yeah, oh, that's extraordinary. Yes. And I ended up coming down the next morning and he said, I can't remember... Oh, yes, no, he was extremely pleased that, that uh, she got a... Companion at last, because he was having an affair with Lottie Burke, <laughs> and she had tried to break into the room when he was with Lottie it's, it's with an axe on the door. A, cho- a chopper, I'm sorry, an axe carrying it, yeah. a wood chopper. It, we, it's a little house in Soho. Yeah. In she was Armenian, wasn't she? Uh, yeah. And she was a very brilliant photographer. Yeah. Very brilliant. But she was quite angry with, with Vic, and he said, if you can keep her quiet and help me in the gallery, you know, you can. Uh, yeah, you described yourself as her sex slave. Uh, actually, that was something I would never have done were she alive. Mm. And I sometimes feel it was a bad thing for me to have said. Of course, it was a bad thing, particularly if she'd ever heard it. And it is perfectly true that some of the duties were on the arduous side. But, <laughs> but it was actually a remark that I made mm. to shock John Gross and a friend of his when I was visiting with John Gross, who was a great mate of mine, much later on in New York, going to have dinner with a friend of his who was a shrink who was asking me about my childhood. And that's what... He said, how did you become an art dealer? The typical sort of the way mm. Freudians like asking mm. their questions. Mm. Uh, and I said, well, actually, I'll tell you that it was my only escape from sex slavery. <laughs> so, and that's, that's how it started. Yes, yes, I'm yes. afraid... It's done. I'd only use it... I mean, I very rarely say it now, but it comes back... Once you make these uh, wrong remarks... You it find it, yes, I'm, yeah. I'm afraid it does. So, John Gross, speaking of Gross, are you wearing your trademark specs? Are they cut and gross? Yes. 
You are. You, we, I've always said it to you, but you are the most stylish man in London. <laughs> 88 or not, you're, you're, you are the poster boy for yeah. my third act. Oh, God. You're the oldest. Well, you my glasses, saying, but you are the I just boy. happened to, to like them when I... It, They're fantastic. It, it, I was here. probably a cutler and grocer before I knew before I knew John, right. or before we were friends anyway. Yeah. But Hockney and I both took glasses quite seriously. We both had to wear them all the time. We both liked round glasses. We both liked shell glasses rather than plastic. Once we had enough money to go in for it all, and we used to go to the same spectacle place called Rainers in off Marylebone High Street. And when you say Hockney had the same glasses. Well, I don't think he's got. The, I don't think he's been to these ones because mm. it, the, this. Actually, now I'd be hard put to say when I started having these, but it's probably only in the last twenty to thirty years. Mm. It's not back when I was David Steeler. Mm. I stopped being David Steeler and stopped seeing so much of him in the early nineties. You know, so once he, I closed the gallery, yeah. we didn't have a falling out. It's just that by then I didn't like it. I haven't liked his work for quite a long time. You see. Yes. I mean, you were the first person to give him a solo show in 1960. It wasn't just that. I mean, I, was his, I, I saved him from poverty in, in 1960. Yes. When I was working yeah. at the Marlborough, he was yeah. a very poor student. Yeah. And I tried to get the Marlborough interested in him, but they weren't. But they allowed me to keep some work under wraps and occasionally sell it. Mm. To, I bought one for myself in a student yeah. show. And I became his sort of dealer without being a dealer you know, it, while I was working for the Marlborough. And so I was his principal selling stuff for him. And wasn't the fact that actually the Marlborough found him distasteful, that it wasn't that no, the catalyst? Scruffy. So was that the catalyst for you going off on your own and starting? No, your... no, no. Because David's work was not what ever made me want to be a dealer. I became an art dealer because of big American abstract painting. I mean, yeah. David's the only figurative person I ever mm-hmm. had anything to do mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. It sometimes annoys me mm-hmm. that... My obituary is going to say discovered David Hockney, mm. like the guy who sort of discovered the beat or something like that. Whereas, in fact, the whole gallery was about something else. And I started a gallery because of something else. And it's not that I didn't like David, both as a person and his art, but it wasn't what I was promoting. What I was promoting were almost entirely large sculpture by Anthony Caro, large paintings by American colour field painters, and what I thought of as, as top English abstract painters like Richard Smith and Robin Denny. You turned the art world or gallery world upside down, really, in London at the time. I mean, instead of the, as you described it, the red velvet coats of the Marlborough Gallery, you saw a huge white space with lots of light, a huge canvas. Yeah, well, big walls that would light. Actually, what we say huge is no longer huge. I just thought that why not make a gallery where you could look at paintings where so many of what I did were around about six foot square. It wasn't so huge anymore, but mm. it, it was to have a gallery where you could look at art on a wall pretty as evenly lit as you could get it lit and but, without furniture around. I mean, so many of the galleries were, in fact, not unrelated to, not, not hinting at, but either converted or not unrelated to English domestic space. That's what you said, And a said, great yeah. many people were, in fact, buying pictures to go over the wardrobe or fit in here or fit in there. Yeah. And I was selling pictures that were a different experience. For their own sake. Yeah. And, and, and the way, way to look at them was different. Mm. What you got out of them was different. You know, they weren't... What did I used to call them when somebody else did it? I used to call the after stuff around adjuncts to polite living. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> but you also, you also thought big. I mean, you described yourself as someone who had chutzpah, which is a... A wonderful word for drive, energy, vision, daring. daring. So you were part of this great swinging landscape of London in the 60s with the rock and the fashion. Yes. And you were the eyes of a generation, somebody described you as. You, you, oh you tutored a generation on how to look at art. A lot of good it? artists. I was lucky that I represented a lot of people that were very good, some of whom are slightly forgotten or not highly valued nowadays, but at the time... It was a gallery. Well, our galleries were different then. You see, with, um, even though mine didn't have a shop window, mm. it was visited. I mean, yeah. most galleries now operate through art fairs and or online or online. Tragic. Right? But even before the online bit, it was mm. art fairs and all that sort of thing. Not, mine had people in it all the time, and they weren't all kids from art students. There were loads of the art students. They'd come. 
in groups, and there'd be lots of them. But there were perfectly ordinary people that read The Spectator, The New Statesman. I never had a great lust to be a rich bloke. But a great many of my clients were lawyers, accountants, psychiatrists, architects, people with a bit of money mm. and that were interested in art. Well, you must look back on those days with, with nostalgia. Well, you were a short of money. I had to work very hard. I could never have run my gallery in the way I did importing art that was often more expensive than English art, that the American artists were often. Mm. Uh, if I hadn't worked out how to sell the pictures in America and in other countries, these people realized early on, the serious collectors, when they went to New York, they were provincials. But when they came to London, they were quite big shots of a different sort. They were the rich American in London. And because I bought pictures and used my eyes and picked mm. them out and had enough money with Sheridan's mm. help to buy it rather than just take on sale mm. or return, they could get a better choice of an American artist with me than they'd ever get in New York, where they just were oh, provincial. Oh, uh, yeah. So they often got a better Ken Nolan from me than they'd ever have got in New York. And so you were able and to... And I had a, a reputation for having a good eye. And where does that good eye come from, do you think? Is it something that was tutored or something you had innately or something you inherited from your parents? There's absolutely no reason why I should have had a good eye. But, I mean, there are people that are quite big in the art world, you know, that really don't have a very good eye. I but Because most people... I mean, you call collectors without a good eye. You usually call them black tie collectors. You know, they go mm. for the, the set, like mm. dressing for dinner. They want... Mm. They know they've got to have a Frank Stella, but they wouldn't know which was a better or more exciting one than another, but they mm. need one. You know, I, I think I really do need to have a so-and-so yeah. one. That, you know, yeah. how could I have an English collection without having a Peter Blake? But then you get a Peter Blake without necessarily saying, I better have, the, you know, a really good Peter Blake. Yeah. Uh, Interested in you saying that you were never motivated by money. Um, well, everybody needs enough. But yes. I mean, it wasn't my major reason I needed to become an art dealer. Or anything. Mm. I think an awful lot of people became art dealers before my day mm. because they couldn't think of anything else to do. Right. Uh, they were often people with enough money but needed mm. some sort of job and it was slightly more interesting becoming a Lloyd's name. An awful lot of chaps leaving Eton used to have to choose between Lloyd's or wine dealing. In the or old army. Days. I know, I oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But my yeah. school was mostly army. They all went to the Indian army from my school. Really? Um, but you have been quite poor in your life. You lived under a bridge, I think, in... The, in no. I, or was that... I apart was from homeless from... under a bridge. I didn't live under a bridge. Oh, you weren't one of your hermits in the... No, 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 no. I was three or four nights. Well, I, I was without money begging my way from Brindisi back to London to try to marry Jane. And I came back to Brindisi in 19... 19- 58, mm. and had to get from Brindisi back to England, but I had pretty well no money at all. And I hitched and begged my way. I'd go to priest's houses in s- small places and ask for bread, and, but not for weeks, you know, for, for, I don't know, a week or ten days, whatever it was. And in Paris, I didn't have any money at all, and I'd begun to suffer from not eating. Really? So that you get a bit yeah. slightly trance-like. Yeah, and one of the artists that showed a pictures gallery called John Christopher who had moved to live in Paris and saw me outside a cafe somewhere trying to work out who might buy me a coffee and he was incredibly friendly and helpful and could see that I was in a bad way and bought me not a coffee but a Guinness significant <laughs> drink perhaps I didn't realise at the time yeah. that's something which sets you up because yeah. it's food yes your travelling with Bug probably started then because you lo- you travelled around and learned to live on I your way. I never wits. ever stopped the travelling from the uh, uh, from the going to New Zealand I mean I've all, but the, the later travelling Bug was when I finally decided to travel with groups. Did the travelling feed the uh, collections? I suppose it m- one must have led to the other, or the one or the collection led to the travelling. They probably fed each other, didn't well, they? Well, eventually, I, I go mountain trekking, or try to, three times a year. Do you still and do I that, age well, nearly 88? Well, unfortunately, I'm all right doing it, or I was last before lockdown, but uh, I go every year to the Bounties Overland. I stay with Christine Camerano, and I'm going this year. But I may not find anyone to walk with. And the, my walking friend, a quiet, retired bachelor who was a terrific mountain walker, who did the whole of the Pyrenees 
with a pup tent alone in two months from coast to coast. Um, Peter's got, well, he's younger than me. I've got, the trouble is I'm suffering from friends with heart problem, cancer problem. Yeah. I mean, you're a phenomenon. There are not many people who can keep up well, with you. Well, it's lucky that I gave up drink and smoking at more or less the same time. And that's why... That was your third act. That was the beginning of your third act. Uh, yes, you? I was... When you gave up... 57 what, or what was the was. What was the trigger for giving up drink? Were you becoming unbearable, do you think? <laughs> I was told to do it for six weeks and glad to be told to do it by a doctor at mm. my medical... I am lucky that I've never actually had anything much wrong with me, but I used to go for the PPP medical centre mm. for insurance purposes mm. once a year. And he said, your liver's in a bad way. And uh, the reason that my liver was in a bad way was that I was drinking more because without anyone telling me, but with my own trying... Most heavy smokers, try, unlike Hockney, try to give up smoking very frequently. Uh, you may have noticed mm. that in your brief span of life. Yeah, uh, I have. The, the, the majority of heavy smokers try, and give up. try to give up. Yeah. And they try to give up so many times that they end up giving up, giving up. Mm. But I decided to have one last try, uh, completely cold turkey, away from the gallery, fuck the business, screw everything else, try to give up. When you're away, you're not doing deals, you're not on the phone, you're not doing this, you're, you're just giving up. And I did it in New York without only telling one person I was staying with. What a, what a bizarre place to do it, where it's sort of Yeah, but social... if I walk from end to end, you say, I find walking uh-huh. helps you give up smoking. Yeah. So uh, I just walked from end to end and avoided everywhere. I only went into buildings where you couldn't smoke. And I then... managed to get the first day done, and then uh, the second day. And, th- and then I went to a very difficult place to give up for reasons of Hockney to Los Angeles, where it's very difficult walking because you're... Stop by the police walk. all the time. Yes, yeah. exactly. But there, there, it's another long story, but there was someone there that was able to help me with um, a sort of treatment, that they, a silly treatment they did, but it was quite good for helping me give up. Um, well, it was called the Magnetic Doctor, and he thought he'd found the cure for AIDS, and he was being financed by one of my artists called San Francis. But and it worked on you. He had a very soothing wife called Beth, <laughs> in a remote, down on the beach not far from where Raymond Chandler used to live mm-hmm. when he was and that helped me I got fed up being stopped by the police for walking uh, <laughs> oh uh, god and did that trigger your so the, well, the smoking it, then gave, stopped well, you once I'd stopped drinking. giving up I added to my drink I said it doesn't matter adding to the drink I'll give that up at another time but I had actually got up by then just three bottles of red wine and a couple of scotches a day. That's and, quite a lot. And for quite a while I was doing that, and that's why my liver was in a bad way, yeah. although I'd given up smoking. Yeah, not surprised. So you were in your 60s at this stage? Fif- Late 60s? 56 or something. But I'd have been having a lot of miserable times. You could understand a bit why I was drinking myself. Why were you yeah. having such well, a... Well, because two of my closest friends were both dying of AIDS. Uh, Sheridan was... was he died of on AIDS. death row, yeah. Well, and sad. so was Bruce Chapman. Oh. And they were two really close friends of mine. Uh, Bruce often lived, you know... So this more was... More or less yeah. lived at my flat in Regis Park. He lived at your flat, I didn't... Well, on a, you know, for periods at a mm. time. So. Uh, anyway, with all this ghastly stress going on, it was an unhappy period. And I was 80s. not very much enjoying David's work then, and I wasn't enjoying the art world. And the, you were divorced by this All sorts of things weren't so good. Uh, and you. it was in the 80s, it was when yeah. the art world was being sartified. Yeah. And your divorce was in the 80s as well? I'd been divorced. That, that fell apart in 1968. Oh. Much longer. Uh, we were friends because of our children, but mm. we weren't well, mostly friends. Mm. But... I then went on a not drinking cold turkey for the six weeks, but realised about two weeks into it that I was never going to drink again. I realised, first of all, you get very slightly happier every day. And then... um, You said, that made me laugh so much, you said... I found myself suffering from happiness, which was a <laughs> oh, did I? Yeah. Well, you have to That's hide it. it a bit because everyone's expecting you to sympathise with you for giving up this wonderful nectar that everybody thinks is so wonderful. Yeah. But I love the and idea you that you pre- might suffer and be happy. It's uh, wonderful. Yeah. Yes. 
suffering happens here. Well, so it means how it did being happy make you feel? So this was a, a slightly new well, sensation. Well, it, uh, it, uh, it was rather terrific, but you had to h- hide the fact that you get... So you, it takes you a while to realise you're going to lose a lot of friends. If you're giving up yeah. drink means you lose friends. Yes. And people that I was quite close to, I mean, not necessarily as a closest friend, but uh, as a mate, and my, I used to run business and do things for Terence Comrade, and Terence was really annoyed that I wouldn't drink. He said, you proved you can stop, you know, for God's sake, share this burgundy with me now, you know. And he's a good smoker. I used to introduce well. him to all my mm. burgundy people. Mm. I used to buy from directly in yeah. burgundy. I met a lot of the people that, I'd go down there and fill the gallery at times with wine. Yeah. So that was a whole lot. Part of your life that went, actually, yes. the, the, the drinking and the smoking. Yes, yes. I've discovered that recently, it's partly because I see friends ill and that, that my life change, being changed by things other than just chance at the moment. And it does make you lose... I'm trying to, I was trying to think of the right word. It's not losing self-confidence exactly, but it's finding yourself in a strange place where... It's not just like the table setting at dinner is different. You've got to work out how to manoeuvre your way through it. It's, it. The whole setup that you're in is slightly different. You know, obviously Alien. a number of things have changed. Well, it's changed. Uh, well, and you've got to work out changed. what your how you're going to move about in this changed setting, which is can change quite fast when you lose a few friends to illness. Mm. And you find your day has changed because it, or your life because there's things that you used to do regularly that you're mm-hmm. not doing. Now, one of the game things that changed the setup, well, of course, was the lockdown and COVID, when a great deal of what you used to do, mm-hmm. you, you didn't do. And mm-hmm. when you came back to it, it, it had changed a bit. Mm-hmm. So Stop. how did you cope with, your, with the lockdown? For someone like you, it must have been quite hard. I didn't have as bad a time as, as most people. First of all, it's an extremely nice area to walk around and live in. Secondly, I decided quite early on that I would use the fact that this isn't my house and that uh, the country house is mine. I'd say I'm working here and then go back to the country. I even mm. went down to Laura Carew's one day, mm. filled the car with pictures and said, I'm selling, working, I'm selling mm. pictures. All right. So, but I didn't do a lot of that, but I did a little bit so that I wasn't as mm. trapped as most people. Regent's Park's not far. I walk a lot. Mm. What helps a great deal as you get older is mobility. The ones that I see that are suffering more are ones like Peter, my hiking friend, and Ian Dunlop, mm. who they often can't walk very far. What you, living in this house is like living on the top of Everest, up and down the stairs every day. I mean, blind. But I do walk a lot. I walk several miles every day. Yeah. And so, and actually, in the last year, I have seen you, whenever there was a sort of chink in, a break in the lockdown, you were out and about again at gatherings and stuff. So I don't think you're going yeah, to be mothballed not any time soon. I'm not so much at. I mean, I used to be at the Wigmore Hall two or three times a week. Now I go, I've only been two or three times since, since it all stopped. And it's slightly different. I mean, I don't want to put it down and say it's no, it's no good, but I mean, it's, there aren't as many things that you're desperate to go and see here as there used to be. There are a lot of people that you haven't heard of and you'll be going down and finding out. But also, I still wear a, a mask on the tube and mm. in the Wigmore Hall when it's crowded. Mm. I wear a mask. It's not as good looking at pictures or listening to music with a mask on. But you are still out and about at parties now. I've seen you in three times. And it's there really is funny. that oh, determination yeah. not to be mothballed, isn't there? You're one. Yes. You're, no, you're not going to be crushed and you're no. not going to be... I had, co- I had COVID itself early on in the very beginning. Unfortunately, I don't think of myself as fragile because the doc- you know, I went down to meet my new doctor yesterday. She said, there's nothing wrong with you. Kaz, you are irrepressible and I think you're going to be around for another decade well, at least. No, really, really, so no, really, thank no, you no, so no, much no, for no, talking no. to me. If you've enjoyed today's show, you can hear more episodes by clicking follow wherever you're listening to this or simply searching The Third Act on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. And if you think your friends would love to listen, please tell them about us. This episode was produced by Pete Norton and Holly Fisher and made possible by Orion's, luxurious residences that are redefining later living in the heart of Chelsea. I'm Catherine Fairweather and I can't wait to join you next week for another episode of The Third Act.